Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, friends. My name is Todd. It's my privilege to serve as the associate pastor here at Sayota Ridge. A joy to be with you live as in person as well as online. I realized this week that I never told you about Julie and my, our big vacation this year. Uh, this May, we, we celebrated our 30th anniversary, 30 years that Julie has tethered herself to be who, is, who has put up with so much, and we thought we should really celebrate that uh, 30 years together. We, we have a big family of four kids, so we never really took big vacations, so this time we decided let's, let's, let's really do all we can. Let's go have a great time. So um, I asked Julie, was my, my job was to plan the vacation, so I said, where do you want to go? The world is our palette. Where, where, where do you want to go? And she said, uh, someplace beautiful. Okay. I know Julie likes mountains and oceans, so I said, do you want mountains or oceans? I would like both. <laughs> the place that seemed to encompass both, where I could get a little bit of mountain and a little bit of ocean, was the Pacific Northwest. So in September, we hopped on a plane and we flew to Portland. And we broke our trip up into three phases. Our first, first phase of our trip we spent in Portland and in the Columbia River Gorge. Second phase of our trip we drove three hours north into Washington to Mount Rainier. And then the third part of our trip we went back along the, the Washington coast down the Oregon coast to uh, Manzanita just a little bit south of Cannon Beach that, that both Jason and Anthony have, have talked so much about. First part of our trip, we're in Portland. It is the weirdest city in the world. Um, it is so much fun. We ate ourselves silly. We hiked in the city. We saw these amazing things. It was wonderful. Went, we, were, we were going to just kind of do a driving tour of the Columbia River Gorge, but when we got to the Multnomah Falls, which are these beautiful, iconic, tall, incredible falls, we found ourselves hiking the whole way to the top and then we ended up doing like a five-mile hike from Multnomah to the, from the bottom to the top, back and around to another falls called the Wakina Falls and the other side back down. It's beautiful. Left Portland, went up to Washington, uh, got in our Airbnb, and about 5.30 the next morning, we set off for Mount Washington. We were going to hike uh, what's called the Skyline Loop at Paradise. Uh, the Paradise Inn at, at Mount Rainier. And it is, it is an arduous, hard uh, hike. It's a, it's a six and a half mile loop. And uh, the first two miles are straight up. And then it teeters around and, there's, and you hit all kinds of terrain from, from crazy rock climbing sort of things to, to these beautiful mountain prairies. And, and we got there, uh, we, we hit the park around 6 o'clock, and it's dark still. And, and Julie and I hadn't caught a glimpse of Mount Rainier up to this point yet. So as we're driving, we go around this corner, and the sun is just starting to come up. Julie lets out an audible giggle, because there in front of us is Mount Rainier, and it's ginormous. It is huge, and it's like this peachish pink color of the morning sun just hitting it. Oh, it took our breath away. The only thing we could do was laugh at how just I can't believe we're here and that we're seeing this. We get there, get to the, the trailhead, and it's, it's about quarter to seven, and we start off, and it's a hard hike the first two miles. But we end up at Panorama P Point where you can see everything everywhere all at once. And we're there, and it's just, I, I can see Mount Hood, which is like three and a half hours away, over almost 200 miles away. I can see it as clear as day right over here. And then there's, there's a, just beauty everywhere. It just took our breath away. Next day, we traveled down the coast, <clears throat> To Manzanita, we got to our Airbnb, and I asked our, our host, I said, what is one thing we should do today? And she said, this is the last day of sunshine. 
So before the day is out, you need to go and spend uh, sunset at Elks Flat, Elks, Elks Rock Flat. Uh, it's a little trail on the other side of, of Highway 1. Go there before the, before the sun sets and it'll be worth your time. So we, it was about 3 o'clock. We went and grabbed some, some dinner, we, we, or an early dinner. We sat on the beach. I put my toes in the Pacific, which was freezing. And then about 5.30, we made our way up to this trail. And we found the trailhead. And I thought our Airbnb host was kind of setting us on a snipe hunt because the trailhead was about this wide through a thicket about this tall. And Julie and I are wearing our sports sandals because we just hiked the day before in our boots. And it's, it's downhill, and we're like, oh, my gosh, did we find the right place? And, and where are we going? And, and just about the point we're about to turn around, the thicket opens up, and there is the whole Pacific Ocean. And we're on this sheer cliff. And it's, it's what's called, what photographers call the golden hour of the day where everything in the atmosphere is this beautiful golden hue and I swear we can see the other side of the world. It was this sacred moment where it was just the two of us celebrating these 30 years together and seeing this beauty and it just, it, every day of that trip, it, I woke up a little bit giddy because of what was coming. And Irenaeus was this uh, church father who, who once said that the, the glory of God is, is, is humanity or, or humans who are fully alive. And in that whole trip from, from when we landed to when we got home, I had this sense that I was fully alive. I think what I was feeling was joy. Well, friends, we are in the second week of this journey of Advent where we are together anticipating and waiting the coming of Christ. We're calling it the anticipated Christ. And together, if, if you don't have one yet, we're following along with this daily devotion. It's called the anticipated Christ by a guy named Brian Zond. He's a pastor out in Missouri. It's a little two, three-minute reading a day that prepares us and helps us on this journey towards Advent. Uh, if, if you're reading this with us, great. If you're not, it's not too late. It'll take you 10 minutes to catch up from last week and then be on page. We've got them in the, the, the back of the, in, in, in the foyer there. We'll be selling them in between the service. You can get them online at Amazon. It's, it's a wonderful read. Last week, Pastor Jason unpacked this word hope for us. And he told the story about how scripture is, is, is not just these individual books with these weird, sort of connected, weird stories in it, but there is one beautiful, grand narrative that runs through the whole story. And he really, he invited us to read Genesis to Revelation through the lens of Jesus. And when we do that, we see that this Jesus really, he doesn't just show up in Matthew and in the New Testament, but all the way back in Genesis 3, there are hints of Jesus and of rescue and of Jesus, uh, Emmanuel, God with us to save us. If you weren't here last week, go to YouTube and, and, and search Scioto Ridge. You can watch it there. You can watch it on the website. It's well worth it to, as we continue to prepare our hearts for this Advent season. But today we're going to be talking about joy. And I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. In the black books in front of you or underneath the seat, it's on page 578. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 35, what we've read a couple times today already. A little background, Isaiah was a prophet who lived in the latter half of Israel's kingdom period. And he warned the leaders of Israel that God would use the empires of Assyria and Babylon to judge God's people for their idolatry, turning to other gods, and for the way that they oppressed and mistreated the poor and vulnerable. 
Now, throughout Isaiah's book, Isaiah goes between this message of judgment for turning from God to a message of hope that God would ultimately redeem God's people by establishing a new king in a new kingdom. And we're going to focus this morning specifically on, on chapter 35, verses 1 through 10. It tells the story, it's this prophetic word of what's going to happen after the judgment when the people return from exile. So I want to invite you to follow along as I read Isaiah 35, uh, verse 1. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and bloom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and shouting. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Now, stop there for a moment, but don't close your Bibles. Isaiah says that the day is coming where the land itself will be transformed. The wilderness and desert the dry places where life struggles to just barely hang on and survive, it's going to blossom and grow. I start again at verse 3. Isaiah says, Strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees. Verse 4, Say to those who have a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come to save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open and the ears of the deaf shall be, deaf shall be open. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. Stop there again. Isaiah says, I know you're tired. Your hands are weak. Your knees are buckling from the weight of it all and your heart has been in this constant state of fear for so long. But don't lose heart. Here is your God coming to save you. The healing isn't just for the land. The healing is for everyone. Eyes and ears will be opened. The broken will leap and dance and the parched throat will sing. That's beautiful. Start again at verse 6. For the waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. Verse 8, a highway shall be there and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, not even fools like me, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Stop there again. Isaiah says the dry, barren, arid desert you've known your whole life, it's going to birth forth with water and quench the thirst of everything around it the wilderness and the desert will be transformed into a great oasis of overflowing and abundant life there's one word that encompasses a response to what god is doing here and that word is joy look at verse 10 And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Three little letters, J-O-Y, the stuff the angels sing to the world and what married gentlemen do instead of dismaying. Joy. Now, to understand where joy in chapter 35 comes from, we need to look and dig into chapter 34. And let me tell you, chapter 34 is dark. Like Anakin Skywalker becoming Darth Vader dark. Like being invited to a wedding in Game of Thrones dark. (laughs) 
like, like Frodo and Sam walking through Mordor dark. It is, it's crazy. Isaiah says in chapter 34, the Lord is enraged against all the nations and furious against all the hordes. He has doomed them and given them over for slaughter. Verse 6 said, the Lord has a sword. It's bursting with blood and his gorge with fat. And verse 7 says, the land shall be soaked with blood and the soil made rich. With I mean, that just sounds like the script for an HBO miniseries, doesn't it? That's some dark stuff. This is the judgment the people are set to face by the hands of the Babylonian Empire because they turned to idols and because they did not take care of the poor and needy in their midst. But the Babylonians eventually come and they raise Jerusalem to the ground and they take everyone who's left and they march them back to Babylon where they're held in captivity for 70 years. Imagine that for a moment. Imagine seeing the destruction, not just of your home and your city, but your nation, and everything that identified you as who you were. Their homes, their towns, their land, it became the barren wasteland and the arid desert. But all that changes in chapter 35. You can't get to chapter 35 without going through chapter 34. God brings healing to the land and to the people as God prepares a road for them to return to their home. Take courage of heart and strengthen your limbs because the heavy weight of exile and punishment has been lifted. Here is your God and he will save you. The people have sinned against God, but God doesn't require them to perform some Herculean task to earn their way back to God. Instead, God is the one who comes to rescue and restore. And their response is joy. God comes to God's people. Later in Isaiah, God sends a new king who will be named Emmanuel. God with us, who will bring streams in the desert, sight to the blind, healing to the broken, and a new and everlasting kingdom, not just for Israel, but for the whole world. The darkness of chapter 34 is followed by the light in chapter 35. And as John says in his gospel, the darkness cannot overcome the light. That is Jesus Emmanuel, God with us to save us. I, I want to look at a couple things real quick about this word joy. First, joy is joy is a feeling. Physically, joy is a bodily sensation of lightness that one feels after having a great weight removed from them. I, imagine for a moment carrying a heavy heavy backpack up the side of a mountain with every step feel your calves and thighs and hamstrings just struggling to lift your foot and move it forward and and your shoulders hunched over and bent from the weight of that pack uh, pulling you to the ground feel the heat in your muscles, the heat in your back, the sweat underneath that pack as you, as you take one more trudge up the mountain, one after another. But then coming to a place where you can take that pack off. You know, those little, those little straps at your chest and your weight when you, when you click them off and they kind of zing off because the weight they've been holding and you work your shoulder out from under and your, the pack drops and at the same time your pack drops, your, your joints kind of free up and you pop up again. That's the lightness of joy. Uh, when the breeze hits the sweat on your back, uh, it doesn't have to be a big breeze. Uh, for me, it feels like I've just bitten into a York peppermint patty. Uh, <laughs> that's that lightness, that 
kind of taking a deep breath again. That's what joy feels like. The pack drops, the weight drops, and you can catch your breath. Now, the feeling of lightness, it expresses itself in different ways. For some, it can be as free and wild and untamed as bursting into song and dance. For others, it can just be a release of a deep breath. It can just be something you've been holding for so long and you just go, it can just also be a calm delight and a sense of profound peace. That's what joy feels like. The second thing about joy is that joy comes when we are present in the presence of someone else. Let me say that again. Joy comes when we are in the present, we are present in the presence of someone else. Look at Isaiah 35, 4 again. Here is your God. Your God has come to save you. Joy happens when we are in relationship with someone who is genuinely with us. There's a psychologist and uh, theologian named Jim Wilder, and he says this. He says, joy is a dynamic relational experience in which you are in the presence of someone who is genuinely glad to be with you. Joy is the experience of your presence bringing delight to others and you delighting in the presence of others. Joy comes when we are in relationship and connected with someone, when we are present in the presence of someone. And that makes joy so much different than just happy feelings. This being present in the present is what makes joy available, not just in the good and beautiful, but joy is also available, believe it or not, in the bad and ugly times as well. Wilder goes on to say that the experience of someone who is genuinely glad to be with us when we're hurting, even when we might weep from grief, is joy all the same. The physical feeling, that lightness, that can be felt in difficult times because someone else genuinely cares about us and someone else, even if only for a moment, can carry that weight with us. The next thing I want to say about joy is is that joy comes to us while we are on the journey. Look at the whole of chapter 35. The blossoming of the wilderness, the streams in the desert, the sight to the blind, the hearing of the deaf, the healing of the broken comes not just when people arrive back in the city of Jerusalem, but while they're on their way in the promised presence of God with them while they journey home. The joy comes as they make their way home. It is while they're in the process of going home that joy comes. It's not only in the destination alone, but it's in the journey as well. The last thing about joy is joy is also a practice. In Philippians 4, Paul says that, invites us to celebrate joyfully in the Lord all the time. I'll say it again, celebrate Let everyone know how gentle and gracious you are because the Lord is near. Your God is here. He has come to save you. Paul says we practice joy through prayer, through giving thanks, through focusing our hearts and minds on Jesus and by attuning our lives to the true and honorable, the just and pure, the pleasing and commendable, and all things worthy of praise. Practicing joy means looking for God and God's highway in the midst of the desert. It means paying attention and looking for Jesus with us in the good, bad, ugly, and beautiful and speaking that to someone you're with. Practicing joy means practicing words of gratitude even when it is hard to find anything to be grateful for in the moment. Practicing joy means being present with people in need 
and being in the presence of people when we would rather isolate in our own pain. The more we look with anticipation to see Christ in our day to day, the more he'll see, we'll see him and the more we'll practice and have the sense of joy as we journey together to his new kingdom. One way that we are invited to practice joy is by receiving these gifts of holy communion of his spiritual body and blood together. On the night that where Jesus was betrayed, on the, the, right before he went to the cross and was crucified, Jesus sat with his disciples at the Passover meal, which is more than just like a potluck. The Passover meal was a time where uh, God's people remembered, they retold the story and celebrated how God had rescued them from slavery in Egypt. And every piece of food and drink and thing on the table uh, was there for a purpose and had meaning. And everything that was said before and during the Passover meal had meaning. So when Jesus took the bread and when he blessed it and gave thanks to it and when he broke it, his disciples would have been expecting that. And it's what they'd heard since they were young and what they had been taught since they were children. But then Jesus went and he did something different. He said, this bread is the bo my body that has been given for you. Every time you eat of it, remember me. And I would have freaked the disciples out a little bit because they didn't know what that meant. They knew the first part, but they didn't know what that meant. And then Jesus took the cup later in the meal and they would have expected that and he prayed over it and he blessed it and they would have known the words he was saying. But then Jesus says something different. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And I don't know if they realized at the time, but Jesus was is laying the new highway through the desert with his body and his blood. So we celebrate communi Holy Communion. Jason and I, as pastors, we're invited to pray over us gathered here and over these elements, so I'm gonna do that now. This is what we say. We say, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. And we say by your spirit, Lord, make us, your people, one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. So we're going to invite you all to...